not been in existence for at least 8,000 years, more likely over 10,000 years. So indeed, if we can establish evidence that the civilization drew its water from the West, then it has to be over 10,000 years old. The mythology of ancient alchemy, which is what we're supposed to call it now, chemetology instead of Egyptology, well, if you allow me to explain the difference here, that uh, Egypt is uh, a title given by the Greeks based on a sentence written at a place called Memphis uh, in Egypt. Uh, still, let's say, this is the place of the image of God, het ka -ta. The Greeks write it down in their uh, letters turning into hey gave tos and that's where the word Egypt come from. But uh, our people are Chemicians, and uh, the land called Kemet means the black land. And the mythology is that the woman is the higher level and the man is the earth. A uh, woman is Nut, the sky, and the earth is Jeb. Uh, and the mythology based on the birth of that woman, she gives birth to the disk of the sun, and this disk has five stages in the sky, and that's the daytime. The birth the stage, and that is the morning day, and th this is uh, this operation known as Sara. Sa means birth, Ra is the disk of the sun, and I think many people use the name Sara, or in America you pronounce it Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's Sara means birth of Ra. First stage known as Khipar, and that's childhood, and the symbol of Khipar is the scarab. The scarab is a beetle, hemophrodite, and that's how we title the children, uh, not a boy, not a girl, just uh, both. And when the disc uh, uh, traveled into the sky where his mother's navel is, and that's the noon when the disc reaches the middle of the sky, and that is Ra himself. Ra is a uh, ram-headed uh, god, or netter, and uh, body of a uh, human. And uh, you may ask me why ram, because ram is uh, stubborn, and that is the stage of what you call today teenage or, yeah. Uh, the third stage of the sun, it's uh, <coughs> early afternoon, and that's known as Oon, yeah, Oon. I write it down, O-O-N for English, and, uh, and it means the wise. And uh, it's uh, a man with a disc on his head. And further, late afternoon, when it reaches the upper part between the, the throat and the breast. It's what we call late afternoon, and this is the stage of Aten, or Aton, or Adon, <coughs> the wiser. And the symbol is the disk of the sun with three beams of light coming from the sun. The latest stage is that woman swallow the, the disk to have that cycle uh, going on. And uh, that stage known as Emin, there's no image for Emin because he is the veiled god, he is the hidden god, equal to Nitr in our ancient Sufi language. And uh, uh, it's the stage of darkness. And that's where we are now. And it starts to uh, around 2000 BC to 2000 AD. Now it's the. Allow me to extract Please, yes. Uh, um, <clears throat> these stages of the sun that Hakim's mentioned, they. Um, not only form the basis for the, the spiritual belief, the stages of, of the day, the stages of life, um, they also form uh, a basis of the cycle of human advancement. And uh, contrary to what we commonly believe, that, that human advancement, human social advancement has gone on an upward curve and maybe a sharp drop, it's it's in a cir it's in a cycle. It's in a circle. So um, the the Netru, the Netters, the gods of ancient Egypt, um, uh, at, an, at the earlier cycle were, were merely aspects of nature. Netter. It's where the Greeks get the word possibly na nature, and uh, they so they were not personified. It was it was the quality of, of being, the quality of light, of love, of harmony, of um, you know, fearfulness with the jackal, uh, um, and the symbols were made 
very naturally, like um, the jackal Anubis was um, one of the, the, the earliest because um, the, when people before they had um, even mud bricks in the egg-shaped tombs uh, built out of reeds and, and things, they, they bury their people and the jackals come and dig them up. And um, so when the first commerce came into Egypt, it was funerary workers, that was the first priest, and they offered a better burial um, because the people believed not in death, but in westing. And uh, you're buried in the west, hoping like that sun that's swallowed by its sky mother every evening after being born every morning, that, um, that you will hitch a ride with that sun on the other day in return. And so the sun and the jackal were two of the, the first symbols ever written. Once the physical threat of the jackal was taken away, the, the priest tacked it in for, for a reminder of why you were paying. <laughs> and so in the case of Osiris and uh, Isis and um, some of these set, um, those didn't come until a later stage, you say, Itin? Yeah, Itin uh, yeah, and Emin, you know, they, they, uh, which Emin The mean? late stages of Itin. Uh -huh. So maybe only 4,500, 5,000 years, which seems short, long, but it's short in uh, 65,000 BC that we go from. Um, and they were, no one's going to like this. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Primarily, um, used for uh, politics and uh, to delineate commerce. Uh, Set, was, Set was beloved to the southern or the upper Egyptians. He was, the, he and Osiris, the divine father um, image, was, was this, the same being with a different title. But uh, when the, the guys in the north were competing with business with ones from the south, as they migrated around, they, they made one the bad guy. The indigenous tradition states that the ancient people over 10,000 years ago had the sophisticated technology to do this type of construction of the pyramids and these aqueducts. And they were using a type of technology which has been labeled by Chris Dunn uh, as ultrasonic machining. Had the ability to use harmonics, resonance, frequencies to do this type of drilling through stone, lifting of stone with anti-gravitational operations to do this accomplishment. And we are just beginning to discover the sophisticated technology and understanding that these ancient people had. We support the work of the Sphinx, Sphinx Project, Dr. Robert Schock, that the erosion on the body and the enclosure of the Sphinx was caused by water, rainfall. There hasn't been significant rainfall in ancient Hemet, Egypt, for at least 8,000 years. So we believe the Sphinx is at least over 10,000 years. The indigenous tradition states that the Sphinx is over 52,000 years old. As for the evidences that we have found, that it seems to be different layers and different stratification. We have found on the surface, just by clearing away the surface sand, remnants of granite aqueducts and water channels. However, we've also found tunnels which go down at least 300 meters, a thousand feet down that end in water. So what we're looking at is very, very sophisticated, particularly on the Giza Plateau, but is in all the sites of Boo Wizard that we have found. We believe there's at least 25 square miles of underground tunnels that we have, that we have uncovered of all different layers and stratification, some on the surface, some a couple of feet down, and maybe some as much as 300 meters down. And regard of what uh, we have of monuments uh, in uh, El Kamit, Egypt, uh, uh, it makes uh, a very small percentage of what we haven't excavated yet. It makes about 18 or 19 percent of what has haven't been found up to date. The famous, uh, for example, uh, for the famous pyramids of Giza, you think there's only three there, but the fact is there are ten pyramids around the area, and uh, this is one of uh, ten groups of pyramids. I can name them for you, uh, like uh, Maidum, Dashur, Fayyum, Saqqara, Abu Sir, uh, and Abu Rawash. This, uh, each of those places uh, have more than uh, one pyramid known and the mini pyramids are still unknown and, and haven't been excavated. And talking about cities, uh, ancient Egyptian, uh, ancient al of course, uh, uh, live on the Nile, which run from south to north. So on the east side of the Nile is the living side where sunrise. And most of the living houses built of silt, mud. And that is washed annually with the Nile flood. But on the west side, which is we call 
We are titled the word death of today, Westing. We have no word, the death in our ancient language. Uh, you see from the Hanot, uh, those who take care of the tombs, which is they take half of the harvest every year, they uh, build uh, strong tombs to uh, not to let the Anub or uh, the jackal attack these tombs. What about the underneath the Giza Plateau? What do, if, you, if you could wipe down, uh, you know, go down a... a hundred meters or something, oh, what would you find? You have uh, many uh, number, big number of tunnels and water running and uh, the, the, uh, particularly beneath the, the Sphinx is a big tunnel uh, linked to Shafrin Pyramid, which is known as Shafrin Pyramid, to Abu Ghraib in, in Abu Siyah. Why the pyramid being built? It's for uh, the energy. And I want to tell you, pyramid is a Greek name for these constructions. We have uh, uh, many of these constructions, but they are divided into four different sections. Learn to know the word per means house. And so there are per netel, and that is the pyramid for energy. And there is per ba, and that's the place of, uh, 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 a place for the spirit, the house of the spirit. And there is per ka, and that's the tomb. And there is per a, and that's the house of the woman, the, the ruler. Per'a, ah, the high house, and this is where the word Pharaoh informed from. Per'a. Ah. So, how it was built? Uh, in my opinion, in 1926 uh, 27, Dr. Uh, Walter Emery, he's uh, an English archaeologist, he spent a long time of his lifetime in Saqqara making excavation. He found by accident a disc made of schist stone. Chest, yes. Uh, I want to tell you that chest stone is a very hard stone, but uh, this uh, disc is carved unbelievable. And it looks like a metal. Yeah, it looks like a metal. It, it like, uh, yeah, and it has three blades like propeller, but uh, it's not the, the blades are not bent to cut the air. It's all in the same level. So when it spins, it creates sound, and this sound uh, deal uh, it makes a. a a vibration, and uh, uh, yeah, that, that's that's an, uh, another instrument to go with that mirror to increase that vibration to deal with the earth gravity makes very heavy stone weightless. So there's a the spinner and the, the mirror reflecting at a particular distance determined in advance, and the stones. I mean, because you've got 180 ton One solid piece. pieces from Aswan, a thousand miles south of, of Giza that are encased in this in this in these pyramids. And uh, if they drag them across the ground, the, the, you'd still have the ruts to this day. As for indications as far as uh, hieroglyphics or markings or, or texts of an indigenous culture prior, it's only illusory. It only has to be how you interpret the glyphs. The culture we're talking about was before writing, so that they did not write. So we're not going to find any texts or manuscripts written by the committed culture over 10,000 years ago. But what we're finding is artifacts, and it's a matter of interpreting the artifacts. There are things in the Cairo Museum that I could show anyone who would come there with me, which we believe are pre-dynastic from the ancient committed culture. Devices made out of stone that we use for sonics, use for sound transmission. But as for actual texts stating these things, it depends on what how interprets the text. The indigenous people who well, the ones who can read the glyphs better than anyone else say that they do give indications of the previous culture. And the symbols can be read that way. But for actual texts, we're not going to find them because this culture is before the time of writing. As for the myth or the story of whether there's a hall of records or rooms under the Giza plateau where there's bodies still laying, or the body of Osiris, blue rooms, different lights, Dr. J.O. Kinnaman, claimed that he and Sir William Flinders Petrie, who he, worked, who he knew over 45 years and worked in Egypt for over 11 years, found the secret entrance to the Great Pyramid on the south face. He claimed they found rooms from Atlantis, records from Atlantis. He claimed that they found anti-gravitation machines that were used in building the pyramid. I'm also aware of the Edgar Cayce readings, the stories of the Hall of Records under the Sphinx. This is also a story that's been kept from the Rosicrucian order for over 2,000 years. So there's a lot of different traditions who talk about Atlantean 
halls of records, in the Great Pyramid, under the Sphinx, under the Giza Plateau, and rooms with things stored in there that tell the history, not only of Chemet, but of our entire planet, and perhaps our entire solar system. I do not know myself personally of any completely documented, verifiable evidence to support any of it as of this moment. However, I still research the story, I'll still keep an open mind, quite possible. We have heard stories, they are just stories, of things that have been found under the Giza Plateau. A blue room, a room where it has to be a sonic code, a sound produced, where a wall of light will be released. There's a, supposed to be a sarcophagus there with a seven-foot mummy who looks like he's still sleeping. That's supposed to be Osiris. There is a story that's been told that they have gotten into this room and that they have removed the body. As of my indigenous sources, in the village of Nazlet Esaman, which is right by the Sphinx of the local people, they do not verify any of these stories as being absolute truth. But that does not mean they are not true. We're still searching, we still keep an open mind. This may be completely sto a true story. Interestingly enough, my indigenous teacher, Dr. Abdel Hakim Awiyan, does not support a story of Hall of Records. His logic is, first of all, if it had to be written down and it had to be hidden, it could not be the complete truth. He tells us we are the halls of records. We have the encoded information in our DNA, in our cells. What he does is he takes you to the energy of the sites, linking you to the energy of the ancient people and the ancient sites, and we become the records. We become aware. So his emphasis is on the archaeological and geological information evidence of the ancient people, of their knowledge, of what they do. He doesn't believe we have to find it on papyrus scrolls. That does not mean they don't exist. We certainly are going to keep looking, keep open. I think it's quite possible, and there is evidence from the indigenous tradition that there were landings in ancient Kemet, that there were contacts. But for the, st for the statement we're making here, we believe these indigenous people themselves, the commissions, over 10,000 years ago, had the sophisticated understanding knowledge of science, engineering, and technology to do this. Now, they may have gotten that extraterrestrials way back in the ancient past that is a possibility i do support the work of zachariah sitchin but we are stating now that these were commissions who did the building of the pyramids and the sphinx regarding the question of uh, extraterrestrial encounters in ancient alchemy um i think we both agree and please kick in if you uh, if you disagree with something um, the, the civilization is so much older than previously stated that there was time for yeah, the them to develop a higher culture. Um, this is the most potent input energy place on the planet, and there are natural uh, power places, uh, if you will. Um, per Ba, that's the, the, um, the beginnings of any temple was these, these natural formations that people would go and get juiced up with, with uh, with cosmic energy and, and energize the senses. Uh, we're not talking about a six or, or seven or a couple dozen. We're talking 360 degree senses. Um, so this this did bring in uh, uh, advanced abilities, and these this culture has has migrated throughout the world. So to say who built the pyramids, uh, the Sesh, the people of alchemy built the pyramids. Who are they? They're us. They're everybody, because we're talking back so far into, in linear history. As far as, um, as uh, uh, beings of uh, space relations, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't call it us and them. I, I, I'd say we have our relations to many other systems. Uh, uh, this, the, the world is very small. The, the planet is a very small village, and this was just a given. Um, that we have these relations. I, I believe that we have some, um, we carry genes of, of other places. Nibiru is a very um, uh, known and impo important uh, part of the Egyptian knowledge and myth. Uh, and uh, uh, the place of Ptah, um, Sirius, and the Pleiades also have their place, not called the same things. Uh, and Venus, and, and uh, these, these Pernetra, these pyramids in the Giza Plateau were um, one of their major functions was as, as transmitters for giving and receiving and sharing information with extrastellar relations. One, one of the major areas of my research which started me really deep into the field of Egyptology was a book called Moses and Monotheism, 
written by Sigmund Freud, actually published posthumously in 1939 after he had died. Sigmund Freud basically was making the statement that this Pharaoh Akhenaten had proffered a religion of monotheism that was great influence on Moses, who was an Egyptian priest. Mos, Mes, really means rebirth of an Egyptian in Kemetic. There are many names, Ramos, Kamos, Amos. Mos was an attracted, means the birth of or rebirth of. So Moses may have strictly been an Egyptian name. So the story that Freud and I support to this day after 30 years of research is that Moses was an Egyptian priest studying under or related to the Pharaoh Akhenaten, whose teachings became the basis of Mosaic Judaism, the belief in one God, etc. No images, no idols. Uh, the, the tradition that, that Akhenaten in Egypt was a failure. Actually, was I call it the Amarna Revolution, because his teachings were revolutionary at the time. He tried to eliminate all the other gods and goddesses, all the other competing religion cults, and basically failed. The people did not understand what he was trying to do. But I believe his place in history was his influence on what became Judaism, then Christianity, then Islam. Egypt has, a, the Chemet had a tradition of five stages of the sun, being five levels of consciousness. What Akhenaten picked was an area called Aten, or Itin, which means the wiser, which means the sun in its full flowering of consciousness. It was an ancient teaching, even in Chemet, which we can trace even back to the first dynasty, a thousand years before Akhenaten. So he did not originate this street teaching, although he is given credit for that. What he did was, and I believe he did have Hebrew blood, this is very involved to go into this, that the Hebrews were in Egypt before Abraham, before the, the biblical tradition. They happened to be a major part of the comedic history. But that Akhenaten took a, a teaching from Canaan, a teaching from the people that were, that were Semitic, with the Egyptian temple teachings of monotheism and created this religion. So what's given credit for Akhenaten to being first inventing monotheism and inventing the Aten religion, now neither are true. He did neither. What he did as a religion, though, was to promote the teachings of Aten above all other teachings and try to eliminate any competition. And that was then handed down to become Judaism, but we believe the Hebrew tradition of monothe monotheism was in Kemet long before the Pharaoh Akhenaten. His physical shape has been something that's been commented on by many Egyptologists. It, in fact, going to the extreme that he had a, a glandular condition, an endocrine condition called Froelich's syndrome. Now, what the statuary shows is an exaggerated condition. What I believe Akhenaten told his sculptors is, portray me as I am. Pharaoh's kings had always been portrayed, glorified, as a super image of masculinity, no matter whether they looked like that or not. We believe Akhenaten, who adopted the phrase Ankh and Ma'at, which means living in truth, wanted things to be realistic. The art during the Amarna, peri Amarna period is some of the greatest art in all of Egyptian history. Very realistic, very naturalistic, much of nature, some beauty. And so what we believe Akhenaten said is, portray me as I am with more of my imperfections, and then we believe they over-exaggerated, that he really did not look like that. There was one bust, which is in the Berlin Museum, which was found in the same place as the famous bust of Nefertiti was found in 1912, which I believe portrays him as he actually looked, and he was not ugly, distorted, and misshapen. Now, there is also another explanation that perhaps there is intimation that Akhenaten was an extraterrestrial and may have directly incarnated into a human body for the first time, and that he was made to represent different racial features. He had Asian-looking eyes, a Caucasian Anglican nose, and Negroid lips, that he may have had connection with a god called Ptah, who was shown that way, who was believed to be of the father race. We don't have his daughter's skull. We do have Tutankhamun's skull. And he was often portrayed as having the same, what's called, platyocephalic skull. However, the skull of Tutankhamun does not show any abnormalness. So I believe, again, the sculptors and the artists were portraying them in that light to connect them, to identify them with, perhaps, an extraterrestrial soul. But we don't have the actual skulls to make the conclusive evidence yet. About, about Akhenaten, uh, the proper pronunciation for uh, this is Ach in Aten, means the shadow of Aton. And uh, Ach in Aton uh, is uh, in the list of the uh, ancient uh, Egyptian rulers by the scholars. He is Amenhotep IV. So uh, the, this is the stage of Amun. I, I mentioned before that this is the last stage.
So the Ammonite or the Ammon followers were hard on the people, and Nefertiti, which is uh, she's the householder, she, she's the hermit of the house, uh, she had the word, and she uh, returned uh, back to Athens. <coughs> and that is like say, we, we don't go for this, we go back to our light, and uh, uh, this is Aton or Eten or Adon, please. The the um, stage of Eten in, in its true true time in that cycle that we talked about is uh, approximately 6,000 B.C. to uh, 2,500, 2,000 B.C. Uh, and this is the, the sun, the, 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 the ripe elder son, the, the, the wiser, and it was a, it was a, it was a time of maturation and, and ripeness with the people. It was a time of wealth, of, of beauty and, and, and harmony. And uh, Akhenaten's time was, um, was well into the dark stage of the hidden god, which we're in, if you look at any of the major religions today, of the, the you know, hidden god. And so he was going back to the good old days of it and trying to, uh, when that, that light was, the quality of the light of being was, was brighter and... So, uh, he, he can't, uh, stand anymore the, uh, uh, Ammon followers in Waset, that's Luxor. So, they decide to, uh, uh, remove the Wast to Tel El Amarna. That, that, that's the name of today, Tel El Amarna, and in the ancient days, known as Achet Aton, the city of Aton. And uh, uh, the, this, uh, of course, uh, was uh, rejected by Ammon followers, but they can't say because if the rules come from the high house, and that's the woman. So they can't do anything about it until the successor, and that's the daughter of uh, Mr. Titi. And I think what we call Tutankhamon, uh, it's not the name, it's just society to an unknown roots child will go in the palace like uh, uh, where, where uh, Anches Amon, that's the name of the princess, and the, 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 the priests of Amon play that part, they put them together, and uh, uh, in addition, when, when they come together, easy to persuade them and turn them back to the Amon. He was a plant. Uh, yeah. And that's why they call him Tut An Amon, thou who give life to Amon. And maybe the, the reflection or the reaction of this sentence, particularly coming to Christianity, that life, that the God is living and life giving. See, there is who has give life to the God. Now, in Christianity, say, God is living and life giving. This is just to fill the uh, uh, fill the aspect of uh, that, that's Tut Amun, 1350 BC said the scholars, but you can't tell exactly uh, when the, the calendar. Uh, Akhenaten, he is the birth of a beautiful woman, uh, Asian background, her name is Tai, and uh, uh, Tai, uh, she uh, and her family, uh, which is Hebani Amran, that, that is in our language. Uh, they are Aton followers. Uh, in the time where the, the people in al Khamid, Egypt, they turn into uh, Ammon followers. Ammon is the darkness and Aton is the light. So well, when uh, this was uh, uh, put in, in the uh, open, uh, then it was uh, easy for the uh, Aton followers to uh, to to be in in, in, in Achit Aton or in Tel El Hamar. She, um, the the mother was was a descendant of Aton followers in Kemet, but that had migrated to Asia to the east uh, a couple thousand years before, and still carried that um, the Adonites still carried that that love of that stage, and so her influence was brought in through her children. Nefertiti and Akhenaten, brother and sister. Yeah, brother and sister, and, uh, and then Hamid and, and Hor. Yeah. Hamid and Hor, that's, that's, that's um, yeah, a part of it. As far as our access to these things, we uh, are not getting official 
government approval, of course. We're not going through the Supreme Council of Antiquities, which is a long, lengthy process. You have to be university credentialed, university affiliated to get an, a permit from the Egyptian government to actually do excavations. We are not doing the excavations. What we are doing is doing surface examination, precursory uh, examinations of layers that have already been excavated, of material that is already exposed, and drawing our own interpretations. Hopefully one day, if the climate is proper, and we can get the proper permits and credentials, we have a lot of basis to do major excavation work. The mythology of ancient Kemet is, is interesting, and it's a lengthy discussion. Uh, the mythology that's used of Isis, Osiris, and Set uh, is basically propaganda that was put out by a priesthood, which Hakim calls Hanut. Um, it's to serve a purpose, to give credence for the popular theosophy, theology that's in event. We do believe there's a possibility that these individuals, particularly Osiris, Wizard, Set, were real individuals at one time in the past, but they have become so mythologized, so used as a propaganda, it's hard to get to the, the real root truth of it. But the myths served a purpose to give credence for the religion that the priesthood was preferring. And a lot of it was for specific propagandistic purposes just in our religions, as in our religions today. The myths and stories of those that have come down for many, many, many thousands of years, what we're saying is they have been altered, changed, just as our St. James, King James Version of the Bible may not be the original story. In fact, Dr. J.L. Kinnaman used to make a statement when he spoke that everything that's mentioned in the Bible is true. But then he would say, but which Bible? So the mythologies that have come down from ancient Chemet are based on ancient teachings that were very important, but they have been altered. They have been changed according to different time periods, to different priesthoods who were in power for their own purposes. And that purposes, unfortunately, a lot of times were just greed and power. So to dig at, to get the ancient truth of the myth is one of the things that we're working on. And you have to go through thousands and thousands of years of layers and alteration. The indigenous tradition says they came from Kemet. He speaks of 42 original tribes which made up the country. Now he talks about a time period going back beyond 65,000 years. So where did they come back before then? They will say always they were in Kemet. Before that, they'll say, perhaps from the stars. As far as a conspiracy to hide information on the Giza Plateau, it's a, it's a very convoluted question. There seems to be, obviously, and I've got from eyewitness and have witnessed myself, things that are going on on the Giza Plateau that are not truthfully reported. When I was there in September of 1997, we found distinct evidence in the Great Pyramid that they were tunneling in the Queen's Chamber. I did not witness it myself because the Queen's Chamber was closed off. However, I got it from three eyewitnesses who were part of an Edgar Casey ARE group whose opinion I respected that there was a tunnel in the east niche of the Queen's Chamber going in at least 100 meters. Someone reported to me that they are digging in the King's Chamber. Now, this is not restoration. This is the official word we're given from the Egyptian government, from the Council, Supreme Council of Antiquities, as they're closing these monuments to do restoration work. You don't restore a monument by digging a tunnel 100 meters into it. One of the amazing things that we uncovered in our last trip to Egypt was evidence, perhaps, of a connection of a Mayan comedic connection. Uh, near the site of Saqqara, there's a temple of an individual whose name was Maya. He was an official of the 18th dynasty of the New Kingdom. That's approximately 1300 BC. But Hakim adamantly said to me there was no name Maya, that it was a title. And interestingly enough, one of the words for water in Egypt today is Maya. So could have the term meant he who came from across the water? Well, we investigated the site. We took pictures of all the lintels and the reliefs, and they all looked comedic. And so I said to Hakim, this is interesting, but I can't go with this. They'll laugh me off the stage because this man looks comedic. Everything looks like he's, well, he's well in Rome, do as the Romans do. He was living in Egypt, so he had himself portrayed as an Egyptian. Well, I said, this is nothing that I can go with. Well, at every site you go in Egypt, there are these little gentlemen who are the antiquities keepers. They're called the keepers of the keys, the, the guardians of the sites. And because I was with Dr. Abdel Hakim, this person knew I was somebody important. He opened up a chapel, which is boarded up on the ceiling with some glyphs that are not commissioned. We had to take a picture of it. Uh, they look very interesting. I sent a copy of this a photograph to Hunbat's men. Mayan daykeeper. He wrote back to me graciously saying, absolutely, it was Mayan. 
He recognized the style, sequence, color, and form, and he recognized two of the glyphs. I have since showed a photograph to other Mayan elders, and they have confirmed that it's very important. They couldn't put it, actually some couldn't even articulate it in words, but they were very moved. And we believe we may have evidence that there was a Mayan living in Egypt 3,300 years ago, but however, according to orthodox anthropology, there were no Mayans then. And there were no Mayans, and there were no Mayan language. But the symbols are very interesting, and there is no doubt in my 30 years of study, they are not commissioned. As to the controversy, whether there are members of the Egyptian government or other governments who are taking artifacts illegally out of Egypt or being sold on the black market, we believe, because Egypt is an Islamic nation, that perhaps the evidence of a previous pre-dynastic civilization, the high civilization that was Khemet, could be damaging to an orthodox Islamic belief system. So that may be a motivation why members of the Egyptian government, Supreme Council of Antiquities, have not revealed things that they have found. There's no doubt artifacts are being found every day and being sold to private collectors all around the world. And there is no doubt that a lot of information that has been found has been suppressed because it may be antithetical to orthodox Islamic belief, and they don't want to stir up the people. We believe the same thing is going on in this country today. The mysteries of ancient Egypt and its hidden secrets. These tombs represent the technology of resurrection. They created monuments that make the mind boggle. Some of their greatest achievements lost beneath the sand and water of the Nile Valley. Until now. Imagine if we could empty oceans or drain the desert and reveal the secrets beneath. Now, we can, using the latest imaging technology to pierce sea and sand and turn accurate data into 3D images. Can scientists solve the mystery of Alexandria's lighthouse and recreate one of the ancient wonders of the world? Why did a pharaoh build 15 megaforts when none of them saw a major battle? This is a forgotten age in Egyptian history because we have lost access to these monuments. And what does a fleet of boats buried six miles from the Nile reveal about Egypt's original Valley of the Kings? Egypt, one of the greatest civilizations on Earth. It lasts for 3,000 years. Its people develop a remarkable written language using pictures and symbols. They worship strange gods. And they build two of the seven wonders of the ancient world. The first the Great Pyramids of Giza. Um, the, the ancients um, determined the seven wonders because they met certain criteria. It is the ingenuity of the design, but it had to be built on a super colossal, over-the-top scale. The Egyptian second ancient wonder is the Lighthouse of Alexandria, known as the Pharos. It is built on a grand scale like the other wonders the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, and the Colossus of Rhodes. Of the Seven Wonders, only the pyramids now survive. But as the waters of the Nile Delta drain away, can the architectural marvel of the Pharos be brought back to life from the seas around Alexandria Harbor and recreated accurately for the first time a sight that once dazzled the world the pharaoh's rank is one of the seven wonders of the ancient world 
because it was something that had never been seen before. Some people say um, the beacon could be seen 30 miles out to sea. Alexandria's lighthouse is a technological and architectural masterpiece. Built in the third century BC, it's the crowning glory of a new capital city founded by the conqueror of ancient Egypt, Alexander the Great. Alexandria was the be all and end all. Um, you might think of the Champs Elysees in Paris or Times Square in New York. Alexandria was all of those things and more. Um, it was the most beautiful city that the world had ever seen. Egypt's new rulers want the pharaohs to send a big and simple message. They wanted to show how powerful is the city. So you need a sign, a big, a huge banner that says, Welcome to Alexandria. The Pharos was created mainly as a landmark. But once Egypt's power has faded, Alexandria's famous lighthouse falls into disrepair. The land beneath it slowly subsides into the sea, and in the 14th century, it finally collapses after it's struck by an earthquake. The Pharos is thought to be lost here, beneath 23 feet of water at the entrance of Alexandria Harbor. Now, a French team of archaeologists is trying to rediscover its true magnificence. Using the latest undersea imaging technology, they're scouring the seabed for clues. Their aim is to digitally rebuild this lost ancient wonder of the world for the first time. Leading the investigation is architect and archaeologist Isabel Harry. She's been searching for the truth about Alexandria's lighthouse for more than 20 years. It's always very rewarding to work on one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. I'd be lying if I said otherwise. Isabel's team is working in one of the largest underwater archaeological sites in the world. They investigate some mysterious granite blocks. These remarkable remains are clearly man-made. Could they be from the missing ancient wonder? Isabel's task is to unlock the true dimensions and design of the pharaohs. But her job is made harder by the wildly conflicting accounts of what it actually looked like. We came across these quite extraordinary images of the lighthouse. Different impressions from past travelers and artists shroud the true appearance of the lighthouse in mystery. It's depicted here as the Tower of Babylon. Here, a very classical building with floors one above the other, with doors opening into mysterious rooms. Over time, ideas about the pharos grew even more fantastic. One of the authors was speaking about the pharos being so tall and so extensively high, if a stone was thrown from the top of the lighthouse, it would reach land in two days or three days. It's not true, but it is saying something about how those people saw the lighthouse. Where does the truth lie? Will the underwater granite blocks provide answers? To find out, Isabel's team uses a technique called photogrammetry, capturing thousands of detailed images across the enormous site. We have a closer view here on the map. This is block 1003. Mm. Do you think we can go further? We can go more on the north? After 28 weeks of diving and with 50,000 photographs, Isabel has the data she needs to finally unlock the secrets of the pharaohs. Combining this unique data with cutting-edge computer graphics means that for the first time, the waters around Alexandria Harbor can be drained away. As the Mediterranean begins to empty, surprising shapes come into view. Near 
nearly 3,000 granite blocks scattered across three acres of the seabed. These are not natural rock formations, but clearly the work of human hands. Statue bases, chunks of pillars, all from a building of monumental proportions. The drowned ruins of a genuine ancient wonder. The Pharos Lighthouse, brought back into the light of day for the first time in 600 years. Already, Isabel's work has delivered one revelation. Some of the blocks from the drained landscape are a crucial clue to the shape of the pharos. Draining the site has enabled us to see the lighthouse. We've even found blocks that might have formed the cornerstones, but no blocks found underwater indicated the wall sloped. The walls were straight. This is the first physical proof of the lighthouse's design. A huge advance on all previous knowledge. But piecing together the rest of the underwater jigsaw remains an enormous challenge. What you have here is a puzzle. Basically, it's a 3,000 pieces puzzle that you have to try to fit things together. And would it fit or would it not fit? And what's more, some crucial parts of the puzzle are missing, taken to museums by previous excavations. <laughs> But one important piece lies nearby, abandoned on the quayside. This was probably the greatest discovery found on the site. But what is it? So here, we have a side part of a door frame. We know because this is the place where the door would have been fixed. This groove is carefully carved as the frame for a gigantic door. And incredibly, Isabel can match the frame's distinctive shape to other stones lying underwater. They must all be pieces from the same doorway. By joining this huge fragment, almost 12 meters long, together with all the other fragments, we can